Jennifer Myring is an amazing agent. She's out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. She's been an agent for seven years. And in the last two years, she's done close to 80 transactions, her as a solo agent. Jennifer, if you could walk us through, what, what's your process? And we will dig into the nitty gritty from there. This is The Agent Goldmine, where you'll find real talk, talk, and ambition. We're here to build real businesses and be more than your average agent. We want to know what the killers are actually doing within their businesses, the reality of it. All tactical, no fluff. So we're here to find out. Please share and enjoy. Welcome back to The Agent Goldmine. What can you can expect in today's show is an overview of the listing process, plus quick tips that you're probably not doing, how to have hard conversations, and how to get your lowball offer accepted. Precisely. Jennifer Myring is an amazing agent. She's out of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and her niche right now is military and investors. She's transitioning to luxury. She's been an agent for seven years, and in the last two years, she's done close to 80 transactions, her as a solo agent, just her and a transaction coordinator. She works a lot of referrals. So if you happen to know of anybody looking to purchase something in the luxury space or has a listing in the luxury space, Jennifer is your go-to. This is a great episode. She's been an agent for quite some time now. She's with eXp and is killing it. You can find her on Instagram, Jennifer underscore Myring underscore real <laughs> underscore estate. <laughs> Enjoy the show. Jennifer, you have blown Allie in particular, her mind at eXp con this past year when it comes to sellers, which is hard to do because Allie is constantly learning things from all the people we interview and conferences and she intakes a bunch of content. And so we were super curious if you could walk us through from the minute a seller lead comes into you, what what's your process? And we will dig into the nitty gritty from there. So a lot of the seller leads that I get are, are warm leads, they're referrals. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's all about communication. We keep communication pretty high throughout the whole, the whole experience with the referring agent, with the client, you know, we have initial, we do obviously the market analysis, and then we come out and we take a look at the property in person. And we just really try to answer all of their questions up front, try to make sure that they have their expectations set properly. As a listing agent, I mean, you, you kill it, right? Like you've done pretty much over 70 transactions in the last two years. What are you doing differently that other listing agents are not doing? I think a lot of it has to do with setting expectations because there's there's just so many moving parts. A lot of times I find that sellers just, they're not in the loop. They don't know what to expect next. And that really makes them feel uncomfortable. So I think that's that's probably the biggest thing. Okay, so the referral comes in. There's a warm handover, which I believe, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it like a group chat or can, from the moment? So it's a group chat where we're introduced. And then do you call next? Do you just get the address and do the market analysis? Like what actually happens once you're connected with that seller? So what I do is I get as much information as I can from them. So we'll talk through text. I'll run the analysis and then I'll set up a call with them. So that way I have as much information as I can. And I can really talk to them intelligently about their home specifically. And if there's anything that needs to be changed from um, the market analysis that I've done, maybe there's information they didn't think of. Um, and, and we're talking in very general terms about the numbers at that point, obviously, because I haven't been to the property. I haven't seen it myself. So it's just, just getting them in the ballpark and Hey, cool. If we're in, if we're in the range, then let's take the next step. Let's go out to the property. Let's take a look and, you know, see how we can get you the most money. What specific information in that text before you run your market analysis, like what are you asking for? Any information about the property, as far as things that they may have done, things that you know, they, they like to ramble off a lot of things that don't really add value, but that tells me kind of how they feel about the property, where their expectation is. If they think, you know, everybody thinks their house is the best house on the market because they've made it exactly what they want. You know, so it just, it just tells me what I need to pay attention to and, you know, how to kind of stroke their ego a little bit too at the same time. Okay, perfect. And then, so, so then you schedule the listing appointment. What do you bring with you? Or is there anything you do from the time that you jump off the phone up until day of listing? Appointment. So I just bring a, a printout of like general questions, all the things that would go into the MLS, just so I don't have to double back and ask those questions again later. I can just get it, 
just makes you look super knowledgeable if you're not having to ask them for things. People hate to be asked the same question more than once, you know? <laughs> okay. And I want to talk about, so the text happens, you gather the information, you do a baseline market analysis, and you set up the time for the listing appointment. You show up at the listing appointment. This is potentially the first time you've spoken to them and the first time you've met them. Can you walk us through, like you knock on the door? So a lot of the times, fortunately for me, a lot of the times the sellers aren't even local. So I'm not, I'm, there's more often than not, I never meet the seller face to face. They yeah, <laughs> they have. That's a bummer because you're so hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. <Go> on. <laughs> you're funny. I'm about to keep going. So okay, those not watching you got, you on got. YouTube, <laughs> you're gonna want to watch this one on YouTube. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> so yeah, so so a lot of times I never meet them. So it really that really requires building a lot of trust through communication. You know, because obviously they don't get to see my wonderful face. <laughs> okay. No, she's dying. Ali's dying. Okay. okay. Well, so let's let's walk through it then. If you are you're going over, is the home normally vacant or is there a tenant in it? So I'm actually working on one right now where there is a tenant and you know, we have to kind of be the intermediary with the property management company. Um, but they're vacating soon. So usually, usually it's vacant by the time that, that I get out there. But so I, I go in, I take pictures of everything because if it's a seller that has been using it as a rental, they don't often know what the property, what the actual condition is of the property. So I take as many pictures as I can. I take as many notes as I can. And I share all of that with them so that they, their expectation of here's the current condition of the property is set. And then I may, I take some notes on suggestions, things that we can do to pretty quickly to and inexpensively to bring the property up to where it needs to be if it needs it. And of course, if there is a seller there, then, you know, it's, it's the whole, give me the tour, walk through, take notes on everything that they say and go from there. Okay. What are the suggestions? So you're going in taking pictures. That's a given. I think everyone can understand that one. Are you uploading them to a Google folder that you share via text or are you like just texting as you go? A lot of times we'll do it through text. Sometimes we'll do it through like WhatsApp if they have that. It just depends on on what their capability is. You know, if it's an older person, obviously they're going to be a little less tech savvy. So I'll I'll text like the like the main ones, the ones that you know give me a reason to okay, this is why I came to this price. Take a look at this and every, and just try to keep that to a minimum. But you know, if if they have like WhatsApp or anything like that, I'll just throw them all in there so they can kind of follow along. We love WhatsApp. Okay. So that's the picture piece and you notes on everything, probably for your own personal records, but then you mentioned the suggestions. And I think that this trips up a lot of people where they're like, I don't know what to suggest. I don't know what is actually going to make a difference. I don't know what price is. So what are normal suggestions that you give? Like, what do you think has the most bang per buck? Cleaning up the yard. If it's Masks, that's the first thing people see. Making sure the front door, because you're standing at that front door for, you know, a couple minutes while somebody's opening a lockbox and really looking around. So making sure that the entryway is really um, presentable. And then when I'm walking through, I just kind of, I, I walk through like once and just kind of try to take in the house, like as if I'm a buyer walking into it. And I take note of the things that I really, that my eyes are drawn to. And those are the things that I typically suggest first, because that's what your typical buyer is going to notice right off the bat. So issues with flooring, um, paint, if it's, you know, that's an easy fix. And just if there's anything like there's like peeling tape on the ceiling, it's simple things that they can fix that will just be less of a distraction when somebody comes through. Do you ever have any sort of pushback, you know, from sellers that are like, Hey, I, that's not the way that I left the property, you know, or, or cause some, like you said, sometimes they've had tenants in there and they have no idea that the tenants have been maybe trash in the place. So it's like a wake up call. Like, Hey, your property manager, or whatever, didn't tell you, but I'm here to show you, this is what your kitchen looks like now. Yeah. How, how do you tackle that? It like for those that maybe get offended too, like, no, that's not the way my house looks. Cause people are, right. are blind to it. You know, it's, it's their love. It's their asset. It's whatever. Yeah. How do you tackle that? Well, I mean, luckily photos are very helpful with that. <laughs> you know, you can't really argue with what, with what you can see. I do sometimes get pushed back on the suggestions. Either they don't have the budget for it or they think it's not really important. And which, in which case, ultimately it's up to them. It's up to the seller. And it's just, okay, here's the expectations. Here's what's going to happen when a buyer walks through. They're going to see this. And now they're thinking, okay, they're they're like negotiating with you in their head over how much they can get for these repairs already right off the bat. 
that is if they are still willing to move forward with it. So it's just setting their expectations for how that's going to impact potential offers, how it's going to impact the buyer's opinion and the length of time that it takes to sell. At, at this point, when you're at, when you're talking about that, have you already, you haven't yet given them your price point of what you're thinking, right? Or did you already? And then you're kind of chipping like away at that. Like a okay, ballpark. ballpark. Just to make sure, because, you know, it doesn't make sense to go do all of this if you throw out a number and they're like, no, 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 my property's worth way, way, way more than that. Or, or they owe too much. And we already know right off the bat, they're only going to make a little bit of money on it and they're not willing to move forward. So I set the expectation of here's the general range. If it sounds like this makes sense, look, now let's go to the property and take a look and fine tune this and make sure we get you the most that we possibly can. Okay, cool. So then once you set up once you sellers agree on a price, what does that look like from there? What is your communication tempo? How often are you? Well, that literally is tempo. <laughs> what are you saying <laughs> when you're talking to the sellers? And up until we get an offer. Thank you for listening. Out of respect for your time, we want to make this show as valuable as possible for you. So if you have any feedback on how we can improve, please let us know. DM us at Allie the Agent and The Shelby Show. We are talking about, obviously, their timeline. You know, they may have things like repairs that need to be done that are going to take a week or two or, or three, or they're going to be out of town or, you know, what, whatever the case may be. I do my best to gauge um, how quickly they want to move because I'm here to move at the pace that they want to move. Um, I'm not here to push them unless they tell me, okay, here's a deadline and now, and then they start dragging their feet. That's, you know, that's when I'll try to push them a little bit and just remind them of, Hey, this is what you told me. You wanted to have a soul by this date. So we need to get this moving. But so, yeah, we're just talking about repairs. We're talking about the timeline and, and expectations for, okay, it, it may take a couple of weeks to get buyers through here and, and to really get some solid offers. So it's, it's just kind of reverse planning from, from their goals and, and matching up with that. Sometimes it's, we're talking every day. Sometimes it's, we're talking every other week until it's ready to go on the market. It just depends on the situation. Are you guys also seeing out there that your first offer is such a low ball? Like always, <laughs> or is that just Tucson? I've gotten some really low ball ones lately, but not, not always. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. That, I find that very common. Like I, I have to tell my sellers like, Hey, the first offer that we're going to get is an investor. You know, they haven't even seen it. They don't plan it on even walking in. They're going to be offering 40 K below. Like we can just really? ignore that one and then keep on. Oh yeah. We can just ignore that and keep on, you know, waiting for a better offer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but okay. So you guys don't have that out there. So once you have an offer come in, what does your conversation or communication look like with, or maybe multiple offers? What does that look like regarding talking to your sellers? So I, I do my best to let them know, Hey, I've spoken to this agent, they're anticipating putting in an offer, just be prepared and just try to keep them updated. I almost, I almost don't like telling them that I'm expecting one until I have it in hand. Same. Be because, you know, it happens. they backtrack, they change their mind at the last second. And it's, it, it sucks to be like, no, okay, it's not coming anymore. But especially with multiple offers, you know, then you kind of have to tell them, okay, we're expecting another one. We've got two in hand. We're expecting two more just so they can kind of pace themselves a little bit. And, and decide if they want to wait for it or not. But we are seeing a lot less of the multiple offers right now. Uh, I think investment properties are really the only ones that are getting, or the really, really nice ones, you know, but the average homes aren't getting nearly as much traffic as they were a year or two years ago. So, you know, I just, I just break down the offer for them in the email, send them the documents. We have a conversation about it, how, what their bottom line looks like. Obviously we do a net sheet and just kind of see where, where they're at with it. You know, if they're super excited or if they want to wait for more. Jennifer, I'm your seller. Yes. And we just got an offer and it is it's decent, it's solid. It's not exactly what I wanted. Yeah. And it's, you know, been on the market for 2 weeks already. Had some decent traffic, nothing serious, you know, decent feedback. It's very middle of the road. Yeah. We get the offer. I'm considering accepting or waiting. What what do you say? What do, what do I need to consider? You need to consider okay, what if we pass this up and traffic dies down and we get no more offers or we get a lower offer because every day it's costing them money. Every day that it sits on the market, it's costing them more money. And the longer it sits on the market, the lower the offers are likely to be when they start coming in. So they need to consider all of that. Sometimes it pays off to wait for a higher offer. A lot of times it doesn't. Jennifer, 
I have decided based on what you said that I don't want to take the chance of the future occurring. I'd rather go with the sure thing. We are now under contract. What happens now? So we wait until they schedule all their inspections and everything. We keep the seller updated on all of the inspections they're doing, when they're happening. Obviously, we're checking in on the appraisal. We're keeping everybody in the loop on that. We are putting together as much information as we can for the appraiser and leaving that at the property. So the appraiser has a nice clean list of all the things that have been done because they really, really love that. It makes their job easier. And then, you know, we, we wait for the inspection that the repair request to come in. And sometimes they're, they're getting a little more crazy than they used to be. We're not getting the offers anymore. So uh, we really have to break that down, especially if it's a lengthy one and say, okay, here's specifically what they're asking for. This is why they're asking for it. And I try, I always try to get from the, from the buyer's agent ahead of time. Sometimes they'll give it to me. Sometimes they won't like a bullet point of what's most important. Like what are the things that the buyer's willing to walk from that way we can have like a real conversation on, okay, these are the top priorities and anything else after that, you know, is, is goodwill towards the buyer. Luckily, my sellers have been really, really good about that. There's only been a handful that have been like absolutely firm on we're not doing X, Y, Z. They're, they're pretty negotiable. So it, it just comes down to, okay, what's, what's the most important thing for the buyer and how can we accommodate that and make sure everybody's happy, but still this isn't, you know, totally one-sided. Yeah. And what typically, what does that communication look like with you and the cross agent regarding the negotiations? You know, we'll, we'll have a phone call. We'll kind of talk about what, again, what's most important to the buyer. What are the key items on that list? And then just kind of setting their expectations of, you know, from what I know of what the seller is willing to do, because most of the time I already have an idea if they're going to just flat out accept this or if they're going to say, okay, no, this is, this is insane. I will talk with the, with the agent, get that list from them, set their expectations so that they can set their buyer's expectations ahead of time. If we need to get us, let's dig into this. Oh, okay. Okay. I am the buyer's agent and my buyers are crazy and they want everything done. So, okay. Yeah. Always. Duh. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's been like a, you know, okay. So I just emailed you a whopping list of that, you know, that your seller was well, some of it, you know, your seller expected you already managed that in the client expectations, but a lot of it is just material, just non-important take her from there. So I'm on, we're on the phone call and you called me and I'm just like, yeah, no, my buyers, my buyers want it all. This are going to have a lot of work to do, Jennifer. Oh goodness. So when we get into that point, a lot of the times I'll try to suggest like maybe doing a credit in lieu of repairs. And then, because what I, what I find a lot of times happens and buyer's agents don't know what things cost. They, they don't like, they don't look at the estimates that come in. They don't, they don't understand. Some of them do. I mean, some of them obviously know very well, but I've, and I've caught a few agents getting estimates from very expensive contractors and sending those in with their repair requests. And they're like way overinflated and it's insane. So what I'll do is I'll send one of our contractors out there and get a new estimate and say, okay, this is in reality, this is what this is going to cost that those numbers were insane. This is what we can get it done for. Let's talk about, you know, the, the repairs that way, or it just depends on the buyer's motivations too, because sometimes it's, they're old and they, they can't do these things on their own and they don't want to have to coordinate anything, or they're just not handy or they're inexperienced and they don't know, you know, that this is a $5 fix and it's not a, you know, it's, it's something a, a 10 year old could do fit a little pipe on there and we're good to go. So it just, it really just depends on, on the buyer and, and why they want everything fixed because we kind of have mm. to tailor that to, to their motivations yeah. to make everybody happy. I think happy. that that's a really good point that you bring up about the overinflated. And that is what I think is a great strategy from the buyer's side. Like if you're a buyer's agent, in whatever market you're in, you know, which companies are just overinflated in their costs, like just unrealistic, use those <laughs> for your buyers to get those quotes, or at least in Arizona, you have to provide quotes, if you're going to be asking for any sort of like money. Well, I mean, I guess you don't have to, but it'd be dumb. Because otherwise, everyone yeah. knows the real quote. But if B&M roofing quotes it at 25,000, hey, my buyer's gonna have to pay 25,000. So yeah. pay up buttercup. So what does that like definitely if in case you don't already have a list of, of vendors that are just extremely 
pricey. Get that list as a buyer's agent. And then also as a listing agent too, it'll benefit you because then you know, no, this is the list that are just unrealistic. <laughs> the rest, yeah, get definitely get that list. So, okay, what does it look like after, oh, actually, before I forget, you also mentioned fast forwarding a little bit in the appraisal that you get everything ready for the appraiser to go out there. What exactly does that include? Yo, real quick, this podcast is not free. Cost of admission is sharing with a buddy who benefit or throwing it on your Instagram story. I guess we'll reshare that. What exactly does that include? So that would include like a list of anything that the buyer that the seller has done to the property. Even if, if it's not stuff that's readily noticeable, like they've put in an HVAC recently, they've done repairs to the roof, they've done any, anything like that. And I'll include comps too. I'll leave an analysis for them so they can see, hey, this is why we arrived at the numbers. It's almost like a preemptive tide, tidewater. Like here's the comps that I used. Feel free to use them. And a lot of times they do. So, okay. That's the appraisal part. Earlier, I was curious about what crazy looks like. I don't think I'm curious about that anymore. I am curious about besides, I guess. So back in my day, back in 2018, my first year so in real estate long ago. Was, was so long ago. <laughs> it was common at that time for buyers to, it was literally in my template offer where the seller will have the home professionally cleaned. They will have the grass cut no, you know, no further than three days prior to closing. They will have, dude, I can't even remember, but we like, it was just like, of course you're giving us everything. Yeah. So I was curious, like, what does crazy mean these days? Is it just like a giant list of repair requests or like, and maybe that is crazy. Like hit me with what you're seeing. Oh gosh, the last one was literally the buyer asked for almost every single thing in the repair request. I mean, in the inspection report, like almost everything. And it was ridiculous stuff. It was just just little things that that could be taken care of. I don't actually see a lot of requests for yard maintenance or for professional cleaning anymore. I just, I don't see them. I don't see them in the offers and I don't see them in the repair requests. What are some things as a buyer's agent that, well, no, you as a listing agent, what are some things that you realize buyer's agents are doing a disservice to their buyers? I would say setting expectations, allowing them to look over that report and not understand what it actually takes to fix some of that stuff. And then also allowing them to write up a repair request that literally asks for everything and letting them think that they're going to get it. Because I've had yeah. I've had deals fall apart with one agent in particular <laughs> that likes to do this and it falls apart at the last minute because the expectations just aren't set. And they ask for a lot of things on especially an investment property and think that they're just gonna get the Taj Mahal at the end of the day when they've lowballed the offer by thirty thousand dollars and you know, it's it's insane. But I I think setting the expectations when it comes to the repairs, like, hey, here's how much this is actually gonna cost. Here's what you can reasonably do or anybody can reasonably do on their own um, or handyman can do and you don't need a licensed GC to do and pay three times as much as you would. And yeah, just just them thinking that they're going to get the entire inspection. Between your clients, your transactions, what, what would you say percentage-wise, what does your sellers look like compared to your buyers? In the last two years, I would say it's probably... Somewhere in the 60, 40 ballpark, 60% listings. Okay. I, I have a couple of questions on the buyer side, but mm -hmm. I want to make sure before we go there, Shelby, do you have anything else? <laughs> I have one more question yeah. on the seller side. Get it. Okay. So, okay. Seller doesn't want to do repairs, but you think they're reasonable and mm -hmm. you know that the buyer is going to fall through if it walk away, if they do not agree. How do you approach that conversation with the seller? Like, you know, you hop on the call and how are you painting the picture to still allow them to have the decision ultimately, but like making sure they really understand what, what that means and maybe guiding them towards yeah. a more, yeah. What does that look like? In that situation, I really try to hit, hit them with, okay, here's, here's what happens if it falls through. This is the, what it looks like. Property's going to go back on the market. People are going to see that it fell through. Agents are going to ask what happened. I've seen the inspection. Now I have to tell them what happened. They're going to ask, you know, all kinds of questions and we have to answer them. And, and that's really going to hurt. You may get lower offers. You're going to lose more money at the end of the day. And if, if we know the buyer is really serious and the seller is just absolutely not, not willing to, I'll have a conversation with the, the buyer's agent. And if it's something that we can reasonably just make happen, a lot of times agents are willing to just 
just make it happen. But I haven't had to do that. Most of the time, it's it's pretty easy to make the seller see, okay, here's what happens if it goes back on the market. And it's going to be, you know, potentially another month, another month and a half, two months before we can get this thing closed. So they're paying paying mortgages and and still having to do the repairs at the end of the day because the next buyer is going to ask for it too, probably. Yep, exactly. Okay, switching a little bit over to the buyer's side. You as a buyer's agent, being that majority of your clients, majority of your transactions are listings, how do you take that information and be able to do just get the best deal for the buyers that you represent? I think explaining, like if if they're offering lower, just really telling the story to the listing agent so that the offer doesn't come across as insulting, just saying, here's Here's exactly why they want to offer this. Either they're older and they they can't they can't handle all these repairs. They they're going to have to pay somebody to come in and do it, or um, they're inexperienced, or or it's their parents and their parents are really driving this. And you know what whatever the case may be, just trying to get the listing agent to understand and always coming at it with like a team mindset. So it's not like okay, this is we're at odds. It's how can we work together to make this happen? And I find it agents are really receptive to that because it kind of, it puts them in your corner too, because they see, okay, you're willing to work with me and explain and be upfront and transparent on at, from the get-go. So the rest of the transaction will go smoother. And that's, you know, as, as opposed to another agent who may submit an offer and have no communication and just sits back and waits for, okay, we accepted it or we're not going to accept it. I think the more, the more you can humanize your buyers to that listing agent, the more they're going to stand out. That's perfect. Yeah. Because so many agents do not do that. They do just submit the offer. Then they text you a day later being like, did you get my offer? Are you going to accept it? I'm like, who the f- are you? Which property? Like, hello? <laughs> oh my God. Where did uh, you come how- from? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. How are you making that, that initial contact with the listing agent? Is it a phone call, a text, an email? What does that look like? I'll usually send a text and just ask them if they're available for a call. Make sure I'm not ambushing them. Can we role play? Jennifer? Allie loves role play. Oh, she just winked. Just so you know, I hate that so much. <laughs> you, oh, you hate role play. Well, you probably we, know that about me. We, we know <laughs> it now because we've asked like four like leading role play questions and you're like, no, 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 and I've got some buyers who are really interested we're planning on submitting an offer and I just wanted to ask you if you've got any offers on the table and if there's anything that's really important to the seller yeah it's a beautiful property I hope that your buyers love it I'm sure that they did and we don't have any offers yet but I have had two other agents said that they were going to submit an offer we're just still waiting on them okay awesome well you will have ours by the end of the day Awesome. What is that going to look like? What kind of what kind of offer are we looking at here? It may come in a little bit lower. We did notice some things that are going to need some some attention, and I will break all of that down in the email when I send you the offer. What should I look for that email? Well, we'll have it to you in a couple of hours, and I'll text you when when I send it over. Awesome. Please escrow with my escrow company. They're the best. Thanks. For the for our the AsianGoldmine.com, our, our golden nugget. Do you have uh, an example of that email? that you send over either, do you have any of these emails like templated that we could have your favorite one and upload it for listeners? I mean, I can make one for you. Girl, you know, we want it. Yeah. Listeners go to the ageofgoldmine.com to get your free golden nugget from Jenner, Jennifer, that is going to be an email template that she uses for her sellers and yeah, go there. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So then I look at the email and it is lower than, than asking. And say I'm a little bit unhappy or my sellers are a little bit unhappy. So I'm giving you a call. This is a second call. You know, you just submitted an offer. We spoke a couple of hours ago. Okay. I'm calling you. Ring, ring, ring. Hello, it's Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. This is Ali Garced with EXP. I received your offer and it definitely did come in a little bit lower, like a lot lower than I was expecting. A lot lower. Did you yeah. happen to read through the notes that I included in the email? Oh, no. Where are the notes and what do they say? Summarize them all for me because I am. So I uploaded some some photos and I did get some 
rough estimates from one of our contractors on just ballpark, what it would cost to fix something like that. And the buyers are really not handy. They're not able to make these repairs on their own. So they are anticipating having to put some money into the property just on specifically the safety aspects. They do have small children and they want to make sure that the home is habitable and safe for them when they move in. I'm trying to find counter arguments, but like that was really good. <laughs> and <gotcha. laughs> Okay. I, I don't, I'll bring this to my sellers. That you were expecting. <laughs> oh, oh, snap. <laughs> no, of course. Okay. <laughs> I'll bring this to my sellers. I don't know what they're going to say, but yeah, I, I will, we'll keep in touch. Jennifer, thanks for your thorough notes. Okay, good. I like that. I really like that you, that, and, and Shelby's writing this in the notes too. Like, did you happen to see the notes that I attached for you? Like, Hey, I did extra work. Did, like, did you not read it? No. Did you happen to see it? Like, you know, that's what I would say. I mean, like, I might not have said there. that quite like that. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's really but good. Listen. And then I've never even thought about saying that the buyers are not handy. That's smart. <laughs> yeah. Know. They think they are, but really aren't. When the wife raises her eyebrows and he says, yeah, I can, I can fix that. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. I, when you're submitting an offer, do you always do that when you come in under list maybe, or maybe ask for a bunch of X, Y, and Z? Do you always upload the photos and do a rest, rough estimate from contractors beforehand? Apple listeners, this short pause is to ask you for a review. Here's how to do it. Back out of the specific episode, go to the page where you see all the episodes, scroll down, keep scrolling. Perfect. Now tap those five stars. Thank you so much. Back to the show. It depends on how much time there is. You know, luckily I have a handful of contractors on speed dial that will, if I just pick up the phone and ask them a question like, hey, the deck's like 10 by 10 and it's falling apart and this is what it looks like it needs. Luckily, I have enough experience with renovating and and construction that I can kind of say, okay, here, here's here's what the problem is. What would it cost? An agent that maybe doesn't know and is just saying, hey, the deck's falling apart. That's a little more difficult to get those numbers over the phone. Um, but at least, you know, just a rough verbal uh, from a contractor will usually will usually give you something to go off from. Um, if I have enough time to do that, then yeah, I'll do that. I think it's freaking genius. I've actually never seen an offer come in upfront. I mean, of course, when they're submitting a repair request, mm -hmm. you'll see these things. Yeah. But upfront to justify like, hey, and to me as a listing agent, especially if you haven't done the super inflated number, because if you do the super inflated numbers, honestly, like I'm kind of pissed off. I'm like, yeah, dude. You know it. I mean, you should. Yeah, know it. I'm like, no. Yeah. But if you come in with legitimate and you're like, hey, like I am actually trying to make this work, you know, and I just want to really be transparent with how we got our numbers and I've already done the legwork for you, I would never pass out because I don't know of another agent out there. I mean, it's very rare to find anyone who puts in extra work to help the other side yeah. to close a deal that you both want to close. Right. It gives the agent something to take to their, to their seller, which takes the anxiety off from the agent of having to have that conversation. And it puts it totally on the other side. So it already makes them look like they're the good guy. Same with the appraisals too. If you're taking the work off the appraiser, the appraiser is automatically going to appreciate that. And you're more likely to get the numbers that you want. Yeah, I totally agree. And there's like an element of even coaching that I, I feel like you probably do this naturally. Do you feel like you're ever coaching the other agent through how to actually agent, but in a very like tactful way where it's like, and I know, you know, the seller might think that this is unreasonable, but if you just, you know, help them, you know, understand the, the replications of not, you know, basically like one of those scenarios. And then they're like, oh yeah, I should do that. And now you've coached, you're, you're doing both sides. You should get paid 6%. <laughs> sometimes, not always, but yeah, sometimes there's, you know, agents out there that don't, you know, they don't, haven't been doing it for very long. We live in such a transient market that agents are coming and going and they're just not, you know, super well-versed in how to handle that. I don't try to make it sound like I'm ever coaching anybody because nobody wants to be coached, you know? Right. Yeah. It's all about the subtleness. I'm just trying to help or I'm just coming from a place of understanding. But okay, Jennifer, so you've been in the game for a while and 2023 was kind of rough for most, not for you, obviously, but for a lot of people. And so looking ahead to like 2024, especially, you know, you just mentioned this is transient. 
you know, agents turn over all the time. So these new agents who are coming in in 2024, they don't have the contractor knowledge. They don't know, you know, what, how to talk to sellers and all of that stuff. How would you recommend is the best way for them to absorb knowledge quickly and kind of jumpstart their careers in 2024? Oh gosh, absolutely surround yourself with people that know what they're talking about. Make friends with other agents. Like you should have at least one or two that you can pick up the phone and call and ask a question. Like agents that don't treat you like competition that will will give you some value. And looking ahead, what is next for you? You made Icon last year. I'm sure you're going to make Icon again. But what are you looking forward to this year? I'm really trying to shift my focus more towards luxury and just kind of get to deal with some of the fun, pretty properties. You know, I think I, I feel like I've seen everything that Fayetteville, you know, all of the the standard houses Fayetteville has to offer. So I just kind of want to have some fun with it. That's dope. Before we head to our wrap up, is there anything else that, that we didn't ask that you want to mention? No. Don't worry. Wrap up question number one. What is your favorite app or tool? This can be business or personal. Canva. Canva's amazing. Allie's um, favorite app of all time is also Canva. That's not true. Yeah. She actually hates it. <laughs> really? Yeah, oh, girl. But she's I'm also... Amazing. No, I love it too. I think normal people do. Allie is... <laughs> she's just on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay, carrying on. Question number two. Jennifer, where can people, the people, find you at events this year? Oh, gosh. Well, I'll definitely be at EXPCon in Miami. Just got my ticket. So definitely oh, there. nice. Anything else? I don't know. You tell me. Where should I be? I think Tom Ferry's Summit is really, really good. What is- it's in August. Tom uh-huh. Ferry is like, like uh-huh. a real estate coach. Yeah. But he, he does a lot of different like smaller breakouts throughout the country. But the biggest one is Summit in August in Dallas. Really, really good. Okay. Right. There's a ton of us who are going to. Uh, it's like a swarm. Yeah. And it is. Last year we went, it was so fun. For okay. me, well, I will plan on being there then. We'll send you the deeds too. Yes, and you. next, next year, come to Real Estate Rockstar's Mastermind. It's sold out for mm-hmm. this year. Okay. But anyway. That too. <laughs> okay. We sure will. Next question is how can we or listeners help you in your business besides sending you all of the luxury referrals for Fayetteville, North Carolina and the surrounding areas? I mean, that's the number one, right? <laughs> send me, send me all the people. And where can people find you? I am on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm everywhere. Perfect. And that's Myring spelled M-E-Y-E-R-I-N-G. Perfect. And we are Allie the Agent. We are The Shelby Show. We are The Agent Goldmine on the gram. Give us a follow. Send us any questions that you have. If you have any real estate luxury buyer clients, seller clients out in Fayetteville, you know who to talk to now. Get your golden nugget for free, 99 on theagentgoldmine.com. Give us a five-star review and be a bro and share this show. We out. And And is this all? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Allie. I was waiting to see if Allie had one. What are some things? Oh, I'm blurry. I don't want to be blurry. Hold on. (laughs) What's happening? (laughs) Okay. Ring, ring, ring. Wait, who, who, what are we talking about? (laughs) Now we, we may proceed. Yeah. She's like, no, get me out no, of here. Absolutely. She's like, I'm done. She's like, like you made no me come play. on this show. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, dude. If you want the golden nugget that this guest provided, see the show notes or just go straight to theagentgoldmine.com. That's where we keep all our resources for you. Till next time.